You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Hey, it's Jordan. Here, just in time for your Saturday, is episode four of The Gravy Train. This is my personal favorite because I used to be a newspaper reporter back in another life and a newspaper editor. And these people, who you'll hear from in this episode, are some of the best reporters in the city of Toronto, and they uncovered some of the city's biggest secrets. And the reaction to that was not what you'd expect. So today, please enjoy episode four of The Gravy Train, Headlines. It's, it's just lies after lies and lies. And I've called you pathological liars, and you are. So why don't you take me to court? 80% 80, 80 of them are, are nasty son of a guns. Bunch of maggots. Call media liars yesterday. Can you tell us what we're lying about? Can you say what exactly the media's reported inaccurately? I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You stay, can you stay categorical? You are fake news. It's not right lie. It's a Toronto star going after me again and again and again. A few days ago, I called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. No matter what you say, I found out to the media, you're never going to make them happy. Now, the official opposition is the media. I'll go head-to-head -head with uh, the Toronto Star anytime. I want you all to know that we are fighting the fake news. It's fake, phony, fake. With the incredible assault by media, and particularly the Toronto Star, on me and my family. You know, they want to they wanna spin, uh, spin it. It is unfortunate that the word I did not say has been ascribed to me by the media. The gloves are off, and journalism, in, in my opinion, has sunk to an all-time low. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Gravy Train. Being a reporter for a newspaper in this day and age can be shit. You may have heard, newspapers are dying. Jobs are being cut. You're told to do more with less. A lot of people don't want to talk to you. And a lot of them hate you. It is tough. But one of the great thrills of that gig is that sometimes you know things that other people just don't. There's always this period of time in between when a reporter has the scoop has the big story, and when it actually shows up in the newspaper. And during that time, you are walking around your city with a secret. You can see the city and know the city in a way the public can't, or at least won't, until they read what you've written. It is a beautiful thing, but it's also terrifying and lonely as hell. There's nothing like it, really. And that matters because, well, Toronto City Hall was busy whispering about Mayor Rob Ford's absence from council and gossiping about his drinking and worrying about how the city was going to function with an absent mayor, a young reporter at the Toronto Star had been quietly walking around with the feeling I just described for almost two years. Robin Doolittle had been quietly digging up sources, diligently working to confirm reports and month by month and bit by bit, putting herself and the paper in position to blow the lid off Rob's secret life. When I was a, a very young reporter, either doing general assignment or just started the police beat, I can't quite remember, I was assigned to the, the Ford domestic assault story. That was in March of 2008. Police were called to Ford's house. He was arrested and charged with assault and threatening death. He was booked and released. He didn't discuss details of the incident, but sources at the time said it resulted from a domestic dispute, and his wife Renata had made the call. You know, every family has their problems behind closed doors, as you know. It's just I'm in public life, and mine are more exposed than others. So Ford had been arrested for allegedly assaulting his wife. And I went and did a, a door knock, which is like the most dreaded thing you have to do in this business. And uh, her parents answered his door. She was gone, but they invited me in. English was not their first language, but the impression I had was that things were very messy and tense in that household. 
And in the end, that charge was dropped. But that always stuck with me. That This was a tumultuous household and something was going on here. They seemed to suggest that she was sort of afraid of him at the time. Now, granted, this was all, you know, it's through her parents, but that was kind of my first inclination. That was the first whiff Robin had gotten of problems in Ford's personal life. But that was it for a few years. Until October of 2011, Robin was covering the Pan Am Games down in Mexico when she got wind of the 911 call that Rob made when comedian Mary Walsh showed up at his home. Mayor Ford, it's me, Mark Delahunty. You know, I gave you remember up that. All the old so Robin looked into that. She asked a source about that 911 call. And this opened Pandora's box. They said, look, I don't know exactly what's going on with this Mary Walsh business, but there are a lot of 911 calls made from that house. And that was the first kind of inclination that whatever had kind of been hinted at years ago through this domestic incident was still happening. So a note on reporters and politicians. It is standard practice, or maybe I should say it was standard practice at the time, that journalists do not report on the personal lives of politicians. They don't write about their spouses or their children or any of that, unless it's deemed to be in the public interest. And in 2011, the bar for that was still pretty high. And the public interest point there is that this is the mayor. He has a tremendous amount of power over the police budget, the police board appointments, and the police are frequently being called to his home for incidents and possibly domestic incidents. There's allegations they've been had to investigate him for, for drunk driving. And so there's potential conflict here. And, and that was kind of the beginning of this. And then it was, you know, a couple months after that, that I got a tip, as a lot of journalists heard about this, this incident at the beer market. That tip, and you might remember this story because it was everywhere at the time, was that a young server at the beer market might have seen the mayor using cocaine. From there, there was an awkward silence once I walked in, obviously, because everyone had just noticed or realized that, you know, I maybe saw something that I shouldn't have. I can remember, like, all the time saying, like, random friends of mine being like, does anyone want to sit at the beer market with me for a couple hours tonight and the star will buy us a couple of beers? Like, I think I did that, like, five or six times. Or, or, and, and other bars, too. Because it was like, uh, I can't, as a, you know, a young woman, just, like, sit at a bar by myself <laughs> like waiting around to draw too much attention or the staff might notice you. But anyway, it was very funny. Okay, so full disclosure. I was one of those people who sometimes met Robin for a beer or two. She was buying. But she would just sit there and wait and talk to anyone who happened by. It was the most basic, boring kind of journalistic legwork. But that's how these things go. And during one of these nights sitting with a friend over a beer at the beer market, Robin met Leo Navarro, the man who had served Rob his poutine, and walked in on something else. He agreed to meet with her at 2 a.m. that night when his shift was over, and he talked, and she started to put the story together. But she needed to corroborate it with someone on Rob's staff. Basically, I convinced his staff to talk to me because they wanted, his staff thought that if the Toronto Star wrote a story about this, they could reasonably deny it. And his support was strong enough that it wouldn't hurt him, but maybe it would force him to go get help because they really felt that it was getting completely out of control. By this point, the Ford family and the Toronto Star had a pretty poor working relationship. The paper had endorsed him, actually, for counsel when he first ran. But since then... They had covered all of Rob's gaffes and scandals and controversy extensively during his time as a city councillor and during the mayoral campaign. In the days before the 2010 election, the star endorsed Rob's opponent, George Smitherman. In doing so, they called Rob a one-trick pony. They called him boorish. And they said he, quote, has never offered any real vision. So Rob returned the favor. On a local AM radio talk show, 
Rob told host John Oakley that, quote, I have no respect for the Toronto Star whatsoever. If people want to read a paper, pick up the Globe, Post, or Sun. That's what I encourage people to do. He claimed the Star's reporting was biased, and he denied them formal correspondence. He denied them press releases. He had his staff take their name off the mailing list. And so Rob's staff thought that if it was the Star claiming that he was belligerent and potentially using cocaine at St. Patrick's Day at the beer market, it might encourage the mayor to moderate his behavior. But also, Rob and the staff could simply claim it was another case of the Star's left-wing reporters going after the mayor unfairly. At one point, the Star did get close to running a story, But in the process of at the very end of that reporting is when the mayor um, attacked Daniel Dale. Okay, I will quickly tell you the story of Rob Ford and Daniel Dale. It is one of the uglier chapters of this whole saga. It could be its own episode. But nobody wanted to revisit it. And I don't either. But I will just give you the facts. It began when Rob wanted to expand his personal property by buying some parkland that was next to it, parkland that was owned by the city of Toronto. And since Rob ran the city of Toronto, you can imagine this raised a few conflict of interest questions. The star got wind of it and they sent a reporter, Daniel Dale, out to the public land to look at it, to take some pictures, to see what Rob's city would potentially be selling to Rob's family. And Rob saw Daniel from his backyard and he ran out and confronted him. He grabbed his phone and he began screaming at him. It almost got physical. And Daniel Dale reported all of this in the Toronto Star. And when he did, Rob made public comments that accused Dale of looking at his kids, insinuated that he was a pedophile. And so Daniel Dale sued him. This is one of the few times that Rob apologized. I want to take this opportunity to clarify my comments made in an interview with Conrad Black and to apologize to Daniel Dale for the way in which the media has interpreted my statements. I never called Mr. Dale a pedophile. I have never used that word to describe Mr. Dale. I do not believe Mr. Dale is a pedophile, nor did I intend to suggest that in my comments. My comments to Conrad Black were in context of my worst experiences with the incredible assault by media, in particular the Toronto Star, on me and my family. It is unfortunate that the word I did not say has been ascribed to me by the media, but I wish to sincerely apologize again to Mr. Dale if my actual words have caused him any harm or personal offense. The end result of this was an even larger and more public fight between the city's biggest paper and its biggest politician. And in light of that, anything the star wrote reporting on the mayor, especially his private life, would have been seen through that lens. So they backed off on Robin's story. Things moved on, you know, months went by. I kind of thought we're never, it's never going to run. And then Sarah Thompson accused the mayor of groping her at an event. Sarah Thompson was a local politician. She'd been a city councillor, and she was among the huge field who had run against Rob in 2010. But in March of 2013, she ran into Rob at an event for a Jewish political group. And after the event, on Facebook, she wrote, I thought it was a friendly hello to Toronto Mayor Rob Ford until he suggested I should have been in Florida with him last week because his wife wasn't there. Seriously wanted to punch him in the face. Happy International Women's Day. She included a photo of the two of them at the event. Rob with his eyes shut and his mouth hanging open and a sweat stain spreading across his white button down. And Sarah wearing a strained smile and dreadlocks hanging down over her black lace dress. They both look uncomfortable. And later, Sarah told reporters, 
Usually, Mayor Ford is professional. He's um, a gentleman, um, and he doesn't act that way. So I kind of did a double take, and then someone said, "Get a picture." So we got a picture, and he put his hand down and grabbed my ass, and that was just so offensive. And um, I was a little shocked, and I was pushed out of the crowd that's around him. And I walked over to uh, people right away and said, "Get he shouldn't be here. Get him out of here. He's not the normal Rob Ford that we all know." Over the next few days, Sarah continued to do media appearances and her allegations escalated. I'm just going through our notes from our, our producer. Um, did you did you think that he was on cocaine? Is that what you had said to, to our producer? I thought he was, yes, I, I, but I don't know. I, I looked up. I went back and looked up, you know, what are the signs of, of cocaine use? I looked it up, and it, you know, sweaty, talking quickly, out of it, um, arrogant, like all these things were on there. From what you know about cocaine, you would suggest, you would you would speculate but, that he was on you know cocaine. What? I don't know a lot. What I read on um, on Google, <laughs> I would think he was either on that or some other substance. I didn't read every drug or I didn't read anything like that, but okay. he was definitely out of it. That was Sarah talking to Roz Weston, co-host of the Roz and Mocha radio show, which is a morning show a top 40 music morning show on KISS 92.5 in Toronto. Rob denied her allegations of cocaine use, and so did his staff, who were at the event with him. She's making a lot of allegations. She hasn't got any evidence so far that I can tell to back any of them up. In fact, everyone that she's said that I've heard so far uh, has been pointedly untrue. Other people began to talk about the incident, too. A counselor from the local city of Richmond Hill who had been talking to Thompson at the event, later told a talk radio station, News Talk 1010, that Thompson had said to him that she was going to, quote, go upstairs, I'm going to use my friend here, to get a picture with Rob to use against him in the next campaign. And look, what you need to know here is not who to believe, but you need to know that this story, unlike all the rumors and whispers and gossip at City Hall, was playing out very publicly. It was on major morning shows across the city, music morning shows, top 40 shows. When regular citizens call into their radio stations to offer up opinions on whether or not the mayor was using coke or whether or not the mayor had his hand on a colleague's ass, that bar that I talked about earlier, about personal lives being off limits unless it's in the public interest, that bar has been cleared. The public nature of the Thompson allegations were the last push that the star needed to finally run everything. So Robin had been looking into the rumors of Rob's public intoxication at the Garrison Military Ball a couple of weeks earlier. Now he had been publicly accused of using cocaine and groping a former political rival. Robin teamed up with an investigative reporter at the paper. And together, they reported on those incidents. She'd also met Leo, you remember, and she'd put his story together by then. So they included Rob's behavior at the beer market on St. Patrick's Day. It was all in there. All the whispers and the gossip on the front page on March 26th, 2013. I I remember, um, remember not sleeping the night before. I remember hearing the newspaper hit my door in the morning. Um, and it just, you know, it was the longest thing I'd ever worked on in, the, in that point. I think it was a few days later. I know it was April Fool's morning. I got a call on my cell phone from a number I didn't recognize. And that was this guy saying, I have a video of Rob Ford smoking crack. Do you want to see it? And so a lot of the backlash that happened after the Garrison Ball story, I kind of didn't notice or pay attention to because I was so consumed by this other story. This other story. The man on the other end of that phone call was Mohammed Farah. And here is where we can actually leave behind a lot of the whispers and the gossip. And we can start to tell you this story with reported journalism and court documents. It was Easter Monday. April 1st, 2013, when Robin met Farah at a soccer field in a West End Toronto park. He took out an iPad and he showed her a photograph. It's a famous photograph now. It features Mayor Rob Ford with three young men 
standing in front of a yellow brick bungalow. Farah called it, quote, a crack house. One of the men in the picture was Anthony Smith, a member of a street gang called the Dixon City Bloods. He had been shot dead four days before Robin met Farah. Farah told Robin that he was acting on behalf of a drug dealer, a man he'd met through his work in the community. He said that the dealer was a good kid, but had gotten messed up in the drug culture and he wanted out. The picture of Ford and Anthony Smith was important because this dealer who wanted out was a good friend of Smith's and his murder had shaken him. So to get out of the game, he needed money. And he had, he said, a video of the mayor smoking crack to sell. He wanted $100,000. And so Robin brought him downtown to the Toronto Star newsroom, where he repeated his request to the editor-in-chief, Michael Cook. Cook and Robin had questions about the content of the video. How was that photo connected to the video? It wasn't, except the dealer was friends with Smith. When was that video shot? In the last six months, he said. Where, he wouldn't say, was Ford alone in the footage? Yes. Very early on, it was like, look, the star can't pay $100,000 for this video. Like, we can't give $100,000 in cash to admitted crack dealers. Crack dealers aside, newspapers almost never pay for information. For one thing, newspapers don't have much money. But for another, if you pay for sources or for interviews or for anything, it creates an incentive for people who want money to create those things. And that takes everybody involved down a pretty dangerous road. On rare occasions, though, and once again, we're talking about matters of high public interest, it does happen. So there was some debate about if the star could pay. But even if they did, they wouldn't pay $100,000. And the price apparently was not coming down. And anyway, before they could even talk money, they needed to investigate these claims and see if the video was real. So I met my, I met my colleague, Kevin Donovan, who ran the investigations team at the Star. I had always felt since Rob Ford was elected in 2010 that I would eventually, he'd land on my, my desk and I would have to deal with him. And, uh, and that eventually happened. Kevin Donovan is a seasoned investigative reporter who had plenty of big exposés under his belt already. He'd worked with Robin on the Garrison Ball story, so he was aware of Rob's personal life, and he was used to dealing with reluctant stories, sensitive topics. So the star made it plain to Muhammad before they would even think about paying anything for the video. Robin and Kevin had to see it in person to make sure it was legit then they could talk. We go up to see the video. We meet at, there's a grocery store at Dixon and there's a big parking lot and we were in and around that grocery store and did not know what to expect, didn't know what we were going to see. Wasn't sure if the guy would show because he flaked several times at this point, but we'd never gotten this far. And at this point, he wasn't backing out. And um, we're sitting in Kevin's car and just waiting and waiting. And I think he was a little bit late. And finally a car pulls up beside us. And it's the contact that I've been meeting with for several weeks now. And this was the broker. And uh, our instructions from the broker were not to take any cell phones, uh, no recording devices, no cameras, and to, to get in the car and he was going to take us somewhere. And uh, I think Kevin convinced him that he needed to bring something with him so that he could be in touch with his kids or something like that. But otherwise, like, we had to leave everything in the car. And so we did that. And uh, we we're driving in the car. I was in the back seat, and Robin was uh, in the front beside the broker. And he drove us just a couple of blocks. And so we, we drive into this uh, building. It's actually a condominium building. And it was, a, it was about 11 o'clock at night, it was a very busy parking lot, a very uh, almost festive atmosphere. There were a lot of people out, cars coming and going, and, and uh, uh, seemed like a nice place, not a scary place at all. People, people often ask me, like, oh, were you afraid at that time? Or, um, yeah, like, what were you thinking? And, and honestly, I was just, the only thing I was afraid of is that I'd 
got the paper involved in a very messy wild goose chase. Like, that is all I was thinking, was like, I hope this is real. Like, that it was the only thought in my brain. I didn't really care about anything else at that point. Eventually, uh, the door beside me, I'm in the back on the right, the door on the left opens, and a fellow gets in. And uh, he's uh, looks very nervous, and uh, we start talking to the broker, and the fellow beside is not saying anything. And the broker eventually convinces him. He says, you know, I want you to show this video to these reporters. He looked very nervous. Um, he had this iPhone. He wanted to hold it. He wouldn't let us hold it. And he says, no volume. That produces another discussion that Robin and I are having with the broker and this fellow. And eventually, uh, he lets us hear the volume. And we start watching it. I thought this video was real, but I was very much expecting, like, dark, grainy. How would we be able to tell it was him? And he finally flipped on the phone. And it was just very obvious it was Rob Ford smoking crack. Like, that is what just kind of struck me. Like, oh my God. Like, he's, he's perfectly framed in this photo. It, it almost looked like like staged in some way. I mean, obviously it's not staged because why would the mayor stage this of himself? But like he, how could he not have noticed this person filming him? He's like squared up and everything. I can honestly tell you that as soon as I saw it and I know as soon as Robin saw it, we knew this was a real video and that was Mayor Ford and apparently smoking crack. And I just remember at the time, because we weren't allowed to take notes or anything and just trying to repeat things in my head of what I saw, like white shirt, glass tube, black at bottom, trying to repeat phrases he was saying, but it was very hard to follow because he was kind of mumbling. Um, And he was very high. And so nonsensical, nonsensical words don't connect into sentences are hard to remember, like that sort of thing. He's slurring his words. It's really, really hard to hear him. And in fact, it was even unclear in the video. He slurred so much at first seemed like he was saying Pierre Trudeau, the, the former prime minister, Justin Trudeau's father, was a, was a fag. And now, then we thought, no, he was saying Justin Trudeau, which would make more sense. I think we watched it three times, and then the guy like ran out, uh, left, and um, our contact drove us back to the car. And uh, Kevin and I didn't really speak. We both pulled out our notepads and kind of wrote up what we could remember before speaking to one another, from the video. The crack video was real. But the star also decided it simply couldn't pay for it. The tensions between the mayor and his supporters and the paper were so high already, it was already so personal, that forking over money for a damaging story would have done more harm than good. So they tried to convince the men to give them the video for free. And the men said, No. So while the star tried to figure out what to do next, everything shut down. And that feeling that I described at the very beginning of this episode, walking around with a secret, that was Robin. Those were the most lonely, awful weeks. Like I remember a day or two later, because I'm still doing my city hall reporting job, and someone was doing some sort of like protest about vegetables. It was just like a very activisty, earnest, granola, whatever. They were trying to get people to eat healthier, I think. I can't even quite remember, but I know I wrote a little story about it because it was like a very slow news day. And I think I called them like guerrilla vegetable activists or something like that. And they called me the next day, just like irate because they're like, you are telling people we are using guns. And I was just like, oh my God, I am not saying that. I was just trying to find an in like a slightly interesting word to write about your boring vegetable protest. And then I just remember putting my head down on my desk going, the mayor's smoking crack with gang members and I'm getting yelled at by a vegetable protest group. And this story is just never going to run. And I just lay with my head on the desk for a little while, I think. (laughs) While the star was carefully debating whether or not to run the story and how they'd write it, if they did, and how to describe the video when you couldn't show it to anybody. A notorious American tabloid website was doing absolutely none of that. 
and Jonathan Goldsby, the guy we met last episode, who had been tracking Rob's movements on social media, was getting out of a cab one night on his way to a book launch in Toronto. As I was getting out of the cab, or maybe as I was paying, I checked Twitter and I saw a friend tweet the link to this Gawker story uh, for sale a video of Rob Ford smoking crack cocaine. So I ran across the street into the restaurant, which is up on the second or third floor. I remember seeing friends come leaving the launch in like the stairwell and they're like, Rob Ford smokes crack or something like that. And so I get up there and I see Robin. He ran over to me or something and was like, have you seen this? And like showed me his screen. And I remember just being like, oh shit. Or I probably said a worse word than that. And I like dove under this table, grabbed my purse and ran. I don't think I'd ever seen anyone leave a room more quickly. Because I'd also seen Michael Cook, the editor-in-chief of The Star, was at this book launch, but he'd left 30 seconds before this. And I ran out the doors and I'm running down this like staircase and there's this giant window that overlooks the street. And I see Michael getting into a cab and I just started like banging on the window like a crazy person and just screaming at him. And he happened to notice me up like a story or two banging at the window. And I just was like motioned to him like, wait. And then I ran down the rest of the stairs. I just like ran out on the street and I'm like, Gawker has published the crack video story. And he just said, okay, get in. We're going to the star. And we got in the cab. He called Kevin. The time as a competitive soccer coach, and I had my team on the field just finishing a practice when I got a call to come into the star because Gawker had published. And that was uh, the beginning of a very uh, difficult and eventful and exciting night. The star's story about what Robin and Kevin had seen, about the video, about everything was published online late at night on Thursday, May 16th of 2013. And of course, it was the front page of the paper the following morning. Gawker had published, you remember, the night before. Both stories featured the exact same photo at the top of them. The infamous photo, Rob posing with Anthony Smith and two other young men outside of a yellow house late at night. The star's headline was Ford in Crack Video Scandal. And Gawker's was even more direct. For sale, a video of Toronto Mayor Rob Ford smoking crack. And those stories landed, and then all hell broke loose. And Kevin Donovan remembers the next morning. I always answer my phone, and I mean, I think we probably all went home from the star around 2 or 3 in the morning, and, and at 6 a.m., uh, and maybe a bit before, I was called by some of... Uh, Toronto's uh, radio stations. And in one case, I did not immediately realize that I was live. And they were at me and very tough. How dare you write this about Mayor Ford? And you have no proof. The star, after all, did not have the video. And Rob denied the allegations. <laughs> Number one, there's no video. So that, that's uh, all I can say. You can't come on and can't comment, comment on something. That doesn't exist. I, I wonder, and I take pictures with everybody. Rob and his brother Doug had a weekly radio show on a local news talk station. The week after the crack video story was published, they tore into the media in general and into the Toronto Star in particular. No matter what you say, I found out to the media, you're never going to make them happy. You can, no. you can give them 10 bars of gold and they're going to want... Why don't I get 15 bars of gold? Well, you know what, folks, um, that's the media that we have, unfortunately. And uh, they're all getting painted with the same brush. 80% 80 of them are are nasty son of a guns. Bunch of maggots. Sorry, I shouldn't have have said that, but anyways, it's, uh, this is, um, I've addressed uh, these allegations and uh, it's unfortunate that you get put in this uh, situation, uh, but we're moving forward. And I can, and I assure you, I never start a fight, but when someone comes up, and punches you in the head 15 times, tries to attack your, your credibility, your character, uh, try to go after your, your family's character, 
I'm, I'm, Rob, you, you got thick skin. You got a skin on you like an alligator. I'm first to admit. <laughs> I go swinging back. The gloves are off. Uh, journalism, in, in my opinion, has sunk to an all-time low. That rhetoric might sound familiar to you. The Ford brothers had decided that the best reaction to this scandal was to simply claim it was untrue, that the media was making it up. There's a reason this tactic has now become so familiar. It works. Two weeks after the crack video story broke, Ipsos Reid, a Canadian polling firm, found that one half of Torontonians thought the star was fabricating the story because they didn't like Rob Ford. For me, I will never, this will be a, a thing that will, that changed my perspective as a journalist and, and will, you know, impact my career the rest of my life. That poll that came out after the crack video that showed half of the city, half of the largest city in the country, educated, progressive, thought that the Toronto Star fabricated the crack story. Like that a mainstream newspaper would sit down in the hours after an American site, Gawker, published this, publishes this crazy inflammatory story, that the star would sit down and go, oh, shit, like, we should say we have this too. Bang out 1,500 words on this and print it in an hour. Like, is astonishing to me that people could be that media illiterate, that, that, that they think that that could possibly be a possibility. Um, and it just, it, yeah, the fact that half of the city thought that we were making it up just stunned me. And it really dawned on me at that point. Like, people have no idea what we do, how we do it, and, and how, how newsrooms work. Like, newsrooms are not organized to pull off that kind of conspiracy. Hundreds of thousands of people in Toronto did not believe the video was real. And even among thousands who did, many of them defended Rob. They said that this had nothing to do with his job at City Hall. That as long as he was stopping the gravy train and cutting the waste, it was his personal life. Why should they care what he did the rest of the time? I'm a journalist, and it hurts me to tell you this, but the star did everything right reporting this story. And while history has proven them correct, in the moment, they were losing the battle. Rob had figured something out about the media. When I was covering Rob Ford, people often described him as stupid or like, oh, he's just, he's, he's dumb. And um, I was always, I always said, I, I don't think Rob Ford is dumb. I think he has a lot of political brilliance in him. I think he was very good at reading the public and knowing what would play well. And what he did by framing the star as the opposition was a very effective, unethical, not right, but effective tactic. And that's obviously what Trump has done now with all media. And what it does is it puts media in this position where we kind of have to defend ourselves. If you want to address this, number one, it's an outright lie. It's a Toronto Star going after me again and again and again. They're relentless. That's fine. I'll go head to head with uh, the Toronto Star anytime. Let's just wait. Just let's wait. Let's just wait till the election is, and then we'll see what happens. But I, I, I'm second, it's pathological. It, it's, it's just lies after lies and lies. And I've called you pathological liars, and you are. So why don't you take me to court? And then you're in this position where you're seen as fighting with this entity that you're, that you're covering. And it, it's very tricky to say, okay, public, trust us. I need to defend myself against what they're saying, but I'm reporting this fairly and accurately. It's a very smart thing for a politician to do, to not only attack the media, but to attack them by name. And, and it works, unfortunately. Complaining about the media isn't a new political strategy. It's right out of the populist playbook. But what Rob and Doug did was supercharge it. They picked a target. The one that was providing the least flattering information to the public. 
and they went after them, and they were relentless. And no, they didn't convince everybody that the star was lying. They didn't bury the scandal or make it go away. They didn't shut down the star or even force it to retract anything. But what they did do was muddy the waters enough so the people who might be predisposed to side with the Fords or predisposed to dislike the media, and that's a lot of people, had a reason to do that. They gave everybody who wanted one an excuse to say, well, that doesn't matter. That's not real. There's no proof. This rise of populism has come about because people are listening to those people who say that, that the old way of doing politics is bad and we need to you know, clean, clean out politics, and which is what Ford said and which is what Donald Trump says. And so I think what I, what I learned is that, is that people are easily steered in that direction unless you can provide really, really credible information to, to bal- at least balance it out, if not tip the scales towards um, an understanding that, that you know, all politicians aren't bad, all journalists are trying to do is get public information to the public because they are the owners of the information. Next time on The Gravy Train, we'll learn that a cell phone video of the city's mayor smoking crack was actually just a small part of what was going on in Toronto. As you are aware, the Toronto Police Service undertook a very significant major investigation last year. On Tuesday of this week, we received information from our computer technology section that in the examination of a hard drive that had been seized on June 13th, they were able to identify a number of files that had been deleted and that they were able to recover those files. As a result, I have been advised that we are now in possession of a recovered digital video file relevant to the investigations that have been conducted. The Gravy Train is written and hosted by me, Jordan Heath Rawlings. It is produced and edited and all stitched together by Annalisa Nielsen and Stephanie Phillips. Ryan Clark is also a producer, and he did our mixing and mastering. Claire Broussard and Amal Delich provided editorial guidance. Rob Purchase and Daniela Giantomasso provided archival sourcing. A lot of our research for this episode, in particular, came from Robin Doolittle's excellent book, Crazy Town, on the Ford family and his years in power. Lucas Iannetta and Matthew Morrow were our production assistants throughout the production of this podcast. And this podcast, The Gravy Train, is a part of Frequency Podcast Network. You can find this and the other podcast I host called The Big Story and all of our other brother and sister podcasts at FrequencyPodcastNetwork.com or wherever you get podcasts.